All right, so we're there in Luke chapter 6. So we started off this series and we talked about the calling of Jeremiah, and we talked about the message of Jeremiah. Tonight, what I want to preach to you tonight about is the heart of Jeremiah. And you say, well, why in the world will we start off a sermon about Jeremiah and Luke? My, this morning, my, uh, my dad asked me the chapter, and I said Luke 6, and he's like, you know you're preaching on Jeremiah, right? But uh, what, what I want to, we're talking about the heart of Jeremiah. So what I want to do is I want to show you the importance of the heart. Why does the heart matter? Um, I want to make a point about it before we get started here. You're there in Luke 6. Look at verse 45. Luke 6, 45. There the Bible says this, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. So he's saying a good man is good because his heart is good. And it says like, likewise, an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. And so an evil person is evil because their heart is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And you'll have to turn there, but Matthew 12, 34 says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So the idea is this. What's in your heart is going to be manifested. Obviously, only God can see the heart. Obviously, only God knows truly what's in someone's heart. But as far as we as people, how we can tell what's in someone's heart is by their actions. What they do, what they don't do, how they portray themselves. Uh, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. And now, we mainly apply this to bad people, right? Whether it's a bad person in our life or maybe someone who comes into church, we apply it to bad people, right? Like, was what's in your heart will eventually come out of your mouth, and that's definitely true. And we apply that a lot to bad people. But remember, it also said, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. So this goes both ways. It's not just applied to bad people. So good or bad, people's hearts are going to be, we can see what's in someone's heart by what they did and by their actions. So real quickly tonight, the sermon is three attributes or three windows we have into Jeremiah's heart that show us the type of heart he had, the three, three things that we can see by his life and how he lived his life and the things he did and said and didn't do. And we can see the type of heart that he had. And you say, well, how are we going to do that? Same way we tell if someone's bad, by looking at their actions, by the way that they portray themselves and the things that result of the things in their heart. So either in Jeremiah 1, let's just go ahead and start reading in verse number 1 for context. Verse number 1, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest that were at Anathroth in the land of Benjamin. So Jeremiah was not a Benjamite, he was a Levite, he just lived in this area. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. That's not what he said. He said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Jeremiah says, I can't do that. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. So did Jeremiah want to be a prophet? Initially when God came to him and, and said, Hey, I have this plan, and you're going to be a prophet, and you're going, to do, you're going to speak before all these kings, Jeremiah did not want to do it. And because not everybody is like Elisha or Isaiah, where they just instantly stood up and wanted to serve God. Not everyone initially had that in them. Here, there in Exodus chapter 3, uh, start reading verse 1. It says, Now Moses, we're talking about Moses here. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come Come now, there, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God appears to Moses here. And keep in mind, the Bible says that Moses was more meek than anyone on the face of the earth. And God comes to Moses here, and he says, I have this plan. I'm, it's this great plan. I'm going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. They've been in bondage for a long time. And guess what, Moses? You are going to be the one to do it. Verse number 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, we're not going to read the whole thing for sake of time, but as this story goes on, we just see Moses going back and forth with God over this and all the excuses why he can't and he doesn't want to. Uh, go ahead and skip to Exodus 4.10. We're just going to skip, a little, uh, skip ahead a little bit in this conversation. Exodus 4.10, And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent, Neither heretofore, nor since, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So Moses did not want to go either, and notice he comes up with this excuse. And I'm not saying Moses didn't have a speaking problem, or this wasn't a real thing. But Moses says to God, he said, I'm not eloquent. I, I can't speak. I, I maybe stumble over his words or whatever it was. And God didn't say to him, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Let me find someone else. God, God, God almost laughs at him, you can see, and says, now therefore go. He's like, I'm the one who made your mouth. I'm the one who made the deaf and the, and the blind. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, would later come and heal the blind, heal the deaf, and heal those who couldn't speak. And God, God says, go. Because here's the point, a lot of people don't want to serve God, or a lot of people, when they see something in the Bible, they don't want to do that, and that's just human nature. And like I said, I'm not saying it's not harder for some people, but here's the thing, I hate to break it to you, but God doesn't care about the reasons that you can't do what he wants you to do. Now, God does care about you, and God promises to give you what you need, but he doesn't care. When God says, when God commands something in the Bible, he doesn't care when, when we're living this, this life down here and, and God comes and says, hey, change the plans, I want you to do this, God doesn't care about um, how that's going to mess up our little thing we got going down here, right? Turn to Ezekiel 3. Ezekiel 3.10. Because look, God already promises to give you what you need, so why would he care about messing up your little plan for everything adi in addition to that? that he's blessed you with, right? God promises to give you food and shelter. Everything abo else above that is just what he has allowed you to have. Amen. Ezekiel 3.10. This is obviously God uh, talking to Ezekiel. He says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go. Get thee to them of the captivity and to the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. So God tells Ezekiel here, he wa I said, I want you to go speak to my people the words that I'm going to tell you. And he puts this little thing at the end. He says, oh, and by the way, whether they listen or not, whether it even works or not, whether they hear or listen or not, that has nothing to do with it. You're just supposed to go anyway. Uh, a very, uh, something that we can compare to ourselves is soul winning, for example, right? When we go soul winning, if we're in an unreceptive area, that doesn't mean that we're just supposed to not go there, right? Or if, if we go and, and we feel like it's just not receptive enough for us, we're supposed to go anyway, right? It has nothing to do, God, God, this is not the only time God said this to a prophet where he says, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear. Almost like he knows what mankind is inclined to do. When it gets hard, man, what, what do we want to do? We just want to quit. God says, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with whether they listen or not. That's between me and them. You're supposed to go anyway. Amen. This is God's command to Ezekiel and to anyone he tells to do anything. If you could just turn me down a little bit. 
Thank you. Verse number 12, Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in joy. Is that what it says? It says, I went in bitterness. In the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Ezekiel didn't want to go either. Because here's the thing. Your heart's character isn't whether or not you want to do what God says. Because that's just human nature. When God, we don't want to do the commandments, right? Mankind is inclined towards sin and, and, and there is nothing to do with good. So your heart's character isn't dependent on whether or not you want to serve God. It's whether or not you actually do. All right, you're there in Jeremiah chapter number 7. Look at verse, 29, uh, verse 27. Jeremiah 7, 27. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Therefore thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. So God just straight up tells Jeremiah, oh, by the way, it's not going to work. I want you to dedicate your life, Jeremiah, to this message, and nobody's going to listen to you. Just, just, just so you know right now. God, God still expected him to go. It didn't matter what the results were. God expected him to do what he told him to do. Verse 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on high places. For the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. Jeremiah's life was dedicated. Obviously, he, he spoke about different things, and he prophesied to the Gentiles and to the, the captives that were to different types of people. But mainly, Jeremiah's life was dedicated to this one message of the destruction that was going to come to Judah. This is what he prophesied. This is his main message that he spent his whole life prophesying. And here God is telling him, in Jeremiah 7, I believe we're in the reign of Josiah. The book of Jeremiah is definitely not in chronological order. But he tells him, he's like, I'm I want you to dedicate your life to this horrible message that everyone's going to hate you for, but they're not even going to listen to you. He still expected him to do it. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Hebrews 11, chapter 8, this is Hebrews 11, we're talking about uh, the, the, all the people and all the faith of Old Testament believers that they had and the great things they did. Verse 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Here it says in Hebrews 11, 8, that Abraham obeyed God, and he didn't even know where he was going. God just said, go that way. And he's like, we're going this way. And that's how we need to be when God tells us. We don't, God, God doesn't need to give us a reason. God's right in everything he does. He doesn't need to say, okay, here's my plan. Here's how it's all going to work out for you. Don't worry. It doesn't matter if we know where we're going or not. If God says to go somewhere, that's what we're supposed to do. Amen. Turn to Luke 22. Turn to Luke 22, 39. In there in Luke 22, 39, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it says in verse 39, And he came out and went, as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Notice verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Here, Jesus Christ is asking God the Father, do you think Jesus Christ wanted to pay for man's sin? Think about it. God creates man on this earth, and man messes up. A man becomes wicked and evil, so evil that at one point God had to destroy the entire earth because of man's sin and because of how wicked they got. And man is, but yet God loved, for God so loved the world, right? God didn't want to see, because you see, God is, God is just judgment, and God is a holy God, and, and, and God has to be a just judge. But God, as we heard this morning, God is also love. So God went and he paid for the sins of the world. But do you think he wanted to go 
be crucified for man's sin? Do you think he wanted to die and go to hell for three days to pay for man's sin because they just messed up, because they turned against God, because there is none that doeth good? He didn't want to do it, but you know what? He did it anyway. Right. Notice verse 42. He said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. He says, God, whatever you want to do, if it's your will, please, please let this, please let me not go through this. But notice this, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The reason that we're not, the reason everyone in this room is not going to die and go straight to hell is because there was someone who obeyed God's will even when he didn't want to, and that's Jesus Christ. So if you think this isn't important or this is just some minor thing, it's not. All right, it doesn't matter what God says to do. If God commands us to do something, he expects it to be done, and we're just supposed to obey. Now, there's nothing wrong with, as Jesus Christ did here, praying, you know, God, if it's your will, maybe uh, I pray that something else would work out. Or, but if God clearly says to do something, we are to do it. I'll say it one more time. Your heart's character. You say, Jeremiah is not looking very good so far. Well, here's why this actually shows how great Jeremiah's heart was. Because your heart's character has nothing to do with whether or not you want to go. Your heart's character is whether or not you actually do. Turn to Mark 4. Mark 4.16. So first tonight, I said Jeremiah was faithful with God's will. Second tonight, Jeremiah was fervent with his mission. Jeremiah was fervent with his mission. You're there in Mark chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse 16. So Jesus Christ here is explaining the parable of the sower. He's explaining what, uh, what everything is in that parable. He says in verse 16, And these are they, likewise, which are sown on stony ground who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. So we have two different categories here. We have the stony ground and we have the thorns. One is something that others do to you, right? One's persecution. It's things that people do to you, how people attack you. And the thorns is different. That's something you do to yourself. Things you allow, you allow yourself to be attracted by the cares of this world or the deceitfulness of riches or the lust of other things entering in. But here's what's similar about these two things, is they're both things that are going to stop you from serving God. Whether it's persecution that, that is coming at you from other people, or whether it's just you know, ways you let yourself go, they're both things you, you, that will stop you from serving God. And that's why the devil uses these things to, to do that. If you're there in Jeremiah 18, look at verse 18. Jeremiah 18, 18. Then said they, Come, and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. So, again, I believe this is, I believe chapters 1 through 20 are all during the reign of Josiah. It, it may change throughout there. But we're in what might be the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry. And people were already slandering him. And not only are they slandering him, but this is how it often goes, they're also trying to turn others against him. They're trying to turn people against him, turn people away from him. It's not they themselves that are attacking him. They're trying to get everybody to turn against him. Turn to Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah 11, beginning in verse 19, the Bible says, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. This is Jeremiah speaking to God, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. They wanted to kill him. Even in the beginning of his ministry, people already wanted to kill him. Because if you remember during the reign of Josiah, Josiah was a great king. Probably you can make the argument one of the great, greatest kings in Judah that had ever lived. But God made it clear that even during the reign of Josiah, God's judgment was still coming. Now he told Josiah that it would not come in his time, but it was still coming. This message was still being preached during the reign of a good king. 
uh, verse 20, But, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. Therefore thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by her hand. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. So just imagine this, if there were people who hated you so much that they wanted to kill you, if we're trying to get other people to do the same exact thing. Turn to Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah 20 and verse 1 says, Now Pasher, the son of Immer the priest, so in the, later in the book of Jeremiah, like in chapter 21 and in later chapters, you hear about Pasher. This is a different Pasher. This is Pasher, the son of Immer. This is not the Pasher you hear about in other places in Jeremiah. Now Pasher, the son of Immer the priest, who is chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. And then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So Pasher here is the governor of the house of the Lord. He's in charge of the house of the Lord. And you would think that if anybody would be on Jeremiah's side, it would be someone like him. Someone with a spiritual role. Someone who uh, was, was in charge of something like the temple. Verse 3, And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stock. So in the morning he, he brings him out of prison and, he, and you would think that Jeremiah, if, if Jeremiah was anything like any preachers that are out there today, he would be like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way, I didn't mean to condemn anybody, I didn't even, even if he did believe it, maybe he'd say, I, I, I didn't mean it that way. Well, let's see what Jeremiah said. Then said Jeremiah unto him, the Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Magar Mishabib. Verse 4, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon. So he basically tells this guy who had just thrown him in prison and, prison and beat him, oh, guess what, all your friends are going to die, and your whole country is going to be taken captive, and, but he's not done. Verse 6, And thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and be buried there, thou and all thy friends, to whom thou hast prophesied lies. So we have the, uh, this is the perfect response to persecution here. So you say, how was Jeremiah fervent in his mission? Jeremiah was fervent in his mission that every time he is persecuted, every time someone threatened his life, he just, his response was always, thus saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God. He never stopped. He kept going and going and going. Even to the point where he's brought out of prison and the first thing he says is, you're going to die and all your friends are going to die and you're all going to die. He doesn't even shut up until he's released from prison and then keep preaching the word of God. It's just, his response was always, thus saith the Lord God. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. So the context here is we're, not, we're no longer in the reign of Josiah. We're fast forwarding to the reign of Jehoiakim. So the book of Jeremiah doesn't mention, uh, we don't see anything that, that took place in the reign of Jehoahaz or Jehoi, uh, Jehoiakim. Uh, probably because they only reigned, they both only reigned for three months. But this is, so after Josiah, Josiah reigned for 31 years, he died. Jeho Jehoahaz reigned for three months. And then Jehoiakim, who has a lot of, who's mentioned a lot in the book of Jeremiah, uh, then reigned. And this is taking place during the reign of Jehoiakim. Obviously a horrible king. They were, every king after jo Josiah was a horrible king. Uh, verse 23, so I just, I just preached on this story, so I'm not going to, um, we're not going to read the whole thing, but basically God tells Jeremiah to write all the words that he's spoken to him in a book and go into the temple and to read all the words of the judgments. And so they bring it before the king. Some people tell the king about this. Uh, verse 23, And it came to pass that when Je Jehudai had read three or four leaves, so they're reading this before the king, he, Je King Jehoiakim, cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire 
that was on the hearth. So they literally take the word of God and they throw it and they burn it in the fire. You say, why would they do that? Yet they were not afraid. That's why. They did not fear the word of God. They didn't fear God, which is why they ultimately went to captivity. Uh, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. So uh, let's go ahead and skip to verse uh, 27. So the king sends people to go try to take Jeremiah, probably to kill him. Story of his life. Verse 27, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll, and the words which, Jeremiah, which Bar Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, hath burned. So he says, just, just do it all over again. Don't stop. Keep going. Skip to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll, and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So again, what made Jeremiah fervent with his message? It's the fact that he always kept going. Turn to Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 26. I mean, the man just never stopped. He, he was, thus saith the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God. We're there in Jeremiah chapter 26. We're still in the reign of Jehoiakim. Verse number 7. Jeremiah 26, verse 7. The Bible says this, So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass, when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and all the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house into the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and unto all the people, saying, I'm sorry, it was just a big mistake. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. No apology from Jeremiah. Verse 13, Now therefore amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring, bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Here again, he's, he's on the, he, he could be seconds away from dying. And what could be his last words, he's saying, no, nope, God told me to say this, and I'm going to say it. You can do whatever you want to me. And thus saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God. This was Jeremiah. In verse 24, Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. And of course, God takes care of Jeremiah. And this isn't what I'm preaching on, but the, uh, this name right here, Hikim the son of Shaphan, I just noticed this when I was writing the sermon. It's a good reminder on when you're reading through random names in the Bible, you should pay attention to them. You should look into it a little more because there's, there's a lot, there can be a lot more than just another random name. For example, this man, Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, years and years and years and years before, during the reign of Josiah, he was actually one of the priests that was helping Josiah carry out his revival. And later in Jeremiah, we hear about Gedaliah, the governor, who the king of Babylon set up to rule after the captivity. Gedaliah was actually Ahikim's son. So it's just interesting. Uh, random names in the Bible, actually, a lot of them have a lot of significance. But anyway, God takes care of Jeremiah. He but, but the idea is that he never stopped. Jeremiah, turn to Jeremiah 37. Jeremiah chapter 37. So now in Jeremiah chapter 37, we're during the reign of Zedekiah. So Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years. Then the first Bab Babylonian invasion happened. Uh, Jehoiakim reigned for three months. The second Babylonian invasion happened. And now we're talking about Zedekiah, who reigned for 11 years again before the final invasion happened. Verse 37. So this is, uh, this is when the last and final invasion is beginning to happen. It's starting to happen. 
uh, things are building up. Jeremiah 37, verse 12, Then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. So he's just trying to get away from all the mess. Verse 13, And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Arijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. He's saying, You're a spy. Then said Jeremiah, It is false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans. But he hearkened not to him. So Arijah took Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah and smote him and put him in the prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. So Jeremiah is just trying to get away. The poor guy just trying to take a break, go back to where he lives for a while. And someone sees him and they think that he is a spy and that he's going to go to the Babylonians and tell them to uh, be a spy. And so he's falsely accused and they take him. because They're just looking for, him, for, for, for dirt on Jeremiah, I'm sure. They're looking for a reason to throw him in prison. Uh, verse 17, Then Zedekiah the king sent. So Zedekiah was never really against Jeremiah personally. He, he didn't like everything he said, but he was just a weak leader and he kind of just bent to anything anyone asked him to do. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out. And the king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. For, said he, Thou shalt be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. So even when he's brought out of the prison by the king and, and someone who's not even really against Jeremiah, and you would think this is his chance to try to appeal to, to, to King Zedekiah and, and, hey, can you get me out of here? But the first thing he says is, thus saith the Lord God, you're going you're gonna to be delivered. You're going to lose. Just, just letting you know. Verse 18, Moreover, Jeremiah said unto King Zedekiah, What have I offended against thee, or against thy servants, or against this people, that ye have put me in prison? Where are now your prophets which prophesied unto you, saying, The king of Babylon shall not come against you, nor against this land? So he's kind of saying, I told you so. Uh, verse 20, Now hear, therefore hear now, I pray thee, O Lord, o Lord the king, let my supplication, I pray thee, be accepted before thee, that thou cause me not to return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. Then Zedekiah the king commanded they should commit Jeremiah into the court of the prison, and that they should give him da daily a piece of bread out of the baker's street until all the bread in the city were spent. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So he's brought out of prison again, and he's still preaching. Go to look at verse uh, chapter 38. Chapter 38, verse number 1. The story goes on. Then Shepha, Shephatiah the son of Matan, and Gedaliah the son of Pasher, and Jukal the son of Shemaliah, and Pasher the son of Malchi, again, these are different Pashers, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and the pestilence, but he that goeth forth to the, forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall hit, have his life for a prey, and shall live. Therefore, uh, thus, thus saith the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. And by the way, just as a, a note, isn't that what people want to say of us? We, uh, when we have hard preaching and we preach what the Bible says about sin and how to, how to, how to get right in your life, what do, the, what do people say? Oh, you just, you just hate people. You just, you just, you want, you just like to just hate people and just, just preach uh, destruction and this horrible message upon people. But here's the thing: if someone truly loves, if if Brother Jared truly loves this congregation and wants to tell you the truth, he's gonna, he's gonna tell you everything that's in the Word of God. The Joel Osteens out there and and the 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 false preachers of our day, they're just gonna say what they have to say to keep people in the church, right? If someone loves you, they're going to tell you what you need to hear, what they know, just like God is telling these people what they need to hear. God knows they didn't want to hear this, but God told them because he was trying to give them another chance, even when the judgment was already coming. Verse number five, Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. So he's like, do whatever you want. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah the son of Hamalek that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. So he's in this dungeon where there's no food, there's no water. He's accused again. Zedekiah betrays him. 
and he's in this horrible place. Jeremiah chapter 38, verse number 7. Now when Emelech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the, in the gate of Benjamin, Ebed-Melech went forth out of the king's house and spake unto the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from thence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So he's like, okay, whatever. Do whatever you want. Seems like a real strong leader here. Verse number 11, So Ebed-Melech took the men with him, and went in the, into the house of the king under the treasury, and took thence old cast clouts and rotten rags, and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. So this man... Is, is interceding for Jeremiah, and he goes to the king, and he, he's saying Jeremiah's going to die. He hasn't done anything wrong, and he, he intercedes for Jeremiah to the king, and the king says, all right, you can let him out. Verse 12, And ebed Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. And they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing. Hide nothing from me. So he just betrayed the man to the point where he almost starved to death. This is like this, this is the second time that Jeremiah has almost died because of King Zedekiah. And now we, while he, someone else brings, uh, convinces the king to bring him out, and he's like, hey, I want your help. He has the gall to ask this guy for help. And then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declared unto thee, Wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king sware secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death. Neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Verse 17, Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts. He just doesn't stop. It's just he keeps going and going and going. If, if he, to the point where on numerous occasions he almost dies. And with what could be his last words, it's here's what God says. Here's what God says. Here's what God said. Turn to Jeremiah 42. Jeremiah 42. So Jeremiah stays here until the final invasion happens. Until the judgment that he has been preaching about his whole life happens. And then basically what happens is the king of, uh, the captain of the guard of the, the king of Babylon uh, takes uh, Jeremiah and he says, All right, you know, it's, you can go wherever you want. You can go into Judah or you can come to Babylon. We'll take care of you. And he, he shows Jeremiah a lot of mercy. And Jeremiah has the choice of going into Judah or just living, you know, retiring from his horrible life in in Babylon, but still he decides to go back with his people into, um, into Judah. And then uh, we have the story of, of, um, of the governor, and that's a whole other story. But verse 42, so there's a remnant left in Judah. The king of Babylon took everybody out, but God left a remnant. Verse number 1, Jeremiah 42, 1, Then all the captains of the forces in Johanan, the son of Kerea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people, from the least even unto the greatest, came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for, for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk, and the thing that we may do. So they come before him, they're all humble, and they're like, God just God brought this judgment upon us, just... Just ask God what he wants us to do, and we'll do it. Just go and pray to God, and, and we'll just tell us what God wants from us at this point. Verse 4, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass, and whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. I mean, can you imagine how excited Jeremiah must have been his whole life? decades and decades of his life people just were trying to kill him or after him and and finally they're coming to him and they're like just tell us just just like shooting fish in a barrel just tell us 
what God wants us to do, and we will do it. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not even, if we do not even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. So they tell they ask him to uh, ask God what he wants them to do. And we're not going to read the whole thing, but basically the one thing that God tells this remnant, it's a very clear message, don't go into Egypt. He says, stay here and I'll take care of you. Don't go into Egypt. Because these people were going to go into Egypt and God told them, don't go into Egypt. Look at verse Jeremiah 42, 19. So here's Jeremiah kind of wrapping up this message to them. The Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when he sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it unto you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he has sent me unto you. He's like, I've been preaching to you for 30, 40 years, and you haven't listened to anything. Here, but he tells them, here's this one thing God wants you to do. Don't go into Egypt. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, and by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place whither ye desire to go sojourn. And let's see their response. And it came to pass, in Jeremiah 43, 1, And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people all the words of the Lord their God, for the which the Lord their God had sent on him unto them even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men, that's not a good sign, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. It's like face palm. Like, are you kidding me? They finally, you think this would be the most, the most humble point they were ever at. And they come to Jeremiah and they say, Whether it's good or bad, we're going to we'll hearken unto you. What does God want us to do? And he's like, Just don't go into Egypt. Just stay here. And they're like, No, you know, you're, not, you're lying. Verse 5. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations, whither they had been, to dwell in the land of Judah. So he's telling, so they went into Egypt, and he took all the remnant with him. They, they took all the people left with him, and here's who they took. Even men and women and children and the king's daughters and every person that Nebuzar Aden, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet and Barak the son of Neriah. So they kidnap Jeremiah and they take him to Egypt with them. And then we're, we're but you say, what, what, what happens next? Verse 7, so they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed, obeyed not the voice of the Lord. They came, thus came they even to Taphne. So they go into Egypt, they kidnap Jeremiah and take him with them. Can you imagine how devastating the man's life has been? You know, Jeremiah's life never had that inspirational, they shall mount up on wings as eagles moment. It never had that. You know, obviously Jeremiah is going to have some amazing rewards in heaven, but his life on this earth just, it was, it was just, it was a, he had a really had just had a horrible life on this earth. Yeah. It was just a horrible, disastrous life on this earth. So what does he do? Ver, Jeremiah 43, 8. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah and Taphne, saying, so skip to Jeremiah 44, 1. Jeremiah 44, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell to Migdal and the Taphnes and Anoph and in the country of Pathos, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. He just didn't stop. He just kept going. Unto the very end of his life. And now we have this message here is, because um, remember, the book's not in chronological order. This message here is the last recorded message we ever hear from Jeremiah. That's it. We don't know how his life ended up. or I mean, as far as we're concerned, or as far as we know, he just died in Egypt because of these horrible people that he was sent to preach to. He never stopped. And it, you, know, you read it, and it turned to Jeremiah 20, 20 verse 7. You read it, and it almost sounds like he's some sort of superhuman. Like, how, how in the world... Could you do that? How in the world could you get through a life like that and still go? Jeremiah 20, verse 7. O oh Lord, Jeremiah 20, verse 7. O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. 
For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord is made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Jeremiah kept going, but it was, he, he, it's, he didn't ever have doubts. And he didn't ever, I mean, this just shows how horrible his life was, just these words that we see in Jeremiah. And here in verse 9, we have the answer to why he kept going and how he did it. It's uh, Jeremiah 29 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He said, I'm done. It's too hard. I can't do it. I, I, I can't get through this. There's too much persecution. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He's like, I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. It was Jeremiah's love for the word of God that got him through his life. He loved the Word of God. So, I mean, would, would we be able to say that? That we love the Word of God so much that no matter what happened, we just we couldn't stop even if we wanted to. Even if our flesh wanted us to quit and wanted us to stop, we just we couldn't. You don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah loved the Word of God so much. It was the joy of his heart. It was, what gave, it was what gave him the most happiness. Remember this morning we talked about not just temporary happiness, but that joy, that peace that passed along understanding. It was this peace that he had and this love for the Word of God that he had that got him through this horrible life that he had to go through. Turn to Lamentations 2.11. So first tonight we said... Jeremiah was faithful with God's will. Second, we said Jeremiah was fervent with his mission. He never stopped. Third tonight, Jeremiah was forbearing with his people. I think this is really the greatest window we have into Jeremiah's heart. Because uh, you're there in Jeremiah 2, uh, Lamentations 2.11, sorry. Lamentations 2.11, the Bible says this. This is Jeremiah speaking. Mine eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth. Why? You say, because of your sufferings, because of your horrible life and your trials and what you went through, Jeremiah? No. For the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because the children and the suckling swoon in the streets of the city. Let's rewind to that story about the, when the people came to him and asked him, tell us what God's will is and we'll do it. And he said, don't go into Egypt. Obviously, that's an amazing story that really just, it's just another story that shows that he never stopped. And he ends what we know of his life with, thus saith the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God. But you know what else that shows? I don't know about you, but if I dedicated my whole life to preaching, if I was just this, this lone prophet preaching to this wicked nation, this judgment, and they try to kill me, and they try over and over and over, and I, I, I almost died on numerous occasions, and I had a life like this. Like, this, was, this wasn't just stuff that happened occasionally. This was my life I lived. If the judgment happened, I th you know what I think a lot of us would be doing? Is we'd be like, I told you so. Burn that city down. I told you so. I told you. You get what, you, I told you it happened. But we have in the book of Lamentations, if you're just wondering in a sentence what the book of Lamentations is, it is Jeremiah mourning for those people as if it happened to him. Right. He wasn't gloating in it. And even with this story where they came to him, even he, he still, when they come to him for help, that last time, he's still, even though they didn't even end up listening, he's still, he's like, okay, I'll, I'll ask God. I'll, I'll preach the word of God to you still. He never gave up on those people. He was always forbearing with them even to the end. He knew the judgment was coming. He knew they deserved it. You could kind of apply that to today, right? We know a judgment is coming to America, right? You'd be a fool to say it's not. We know God's judgment's coming. And we know, we know it's going to happen. And we preach it and we, we warn people. But if it, when judgment happens on America, do you think a lot of people would be mourning with America? Do you think we would be mourning with America? You think we'd be mourning with these people of Fresno? You know, I think a lot of people just want it to happen, and so they're waiting just to say, I told you so. Go to hell, all of you. This wasn't Jeremiah. Jeremiah knew they deserved it, and he knew it was coming, but when it happened, he was heartbroken. He was mourning. 
Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says when he came to this earth and he looked at all these unsaved, you know, miserable people, he knew they deserved hell, he knew they were going there, but he had compassion on them. That's why you're saved tonight. That's why I'm saved tonight, because someone was able to look past what we deserved and what's coming and had compassion on us. You know, a lot of people like to call out the judgment of God. Oh, this is the judgment of God, and this is the judgment of God. It doesn't matter. You say, why, it doesn't matter what's the ju judgment of God or not. You say, why doesn't it matter? Because if something happens, whether it's the judgment of God or not, our response doesn't change. We're supposed to still have compassion. Amen. It doesn't matter whether it's God's judgment or not, or it comes or not. Our response does not change. You don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 9 1. You can turn to Jeremiah 12. Turn to Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah 9 1 says this Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah was heartbroken when the judgment happened. He wasn't gloating in it, he didn't want it to come. That's why he, that's why he, that's why God warns, it's the same reason God warns us about hell, is he doesn't want us to go there. He doesn't want us to go to hell. And Jeremiah had compassion on them. You're there in Jeremiah 12, look at verse 10. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard and have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate. Why? Because no man layeth it to heart. He just got done saying, the, the pastors have destroyed my vineyard, and, and all these people, their wickedness, they've destroyed this nation because of their wickedness. But when it comes down to it, why is the land made desolate? Because no one layeth it to heart. No one, no one cares. No one cares. No one cares enough to get right, and the people who have gotten right don't care enough to do anything about it. Turn to Lamentations chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. Lamentations 3.48 says, Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. There in Lamentations 1, we'll end here. The adversary, this is of course Jeremiah speaking, the adversary has spread out his hand upon her pleasant things. You know, you would think that when Jeremiah was set free by the king of Babylon, even when he went back into Judah, you'd think that he would just be relieved, like, it's over. It happened. God told me to warn him, and it happened. I'm done. My work here is done. I have finished my course. I have done what God has told me to do. But where was Jeremiah at when the captivity happened? Let's keep reading. For she hath seen that her, the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. All her people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their pleasant things for me to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Nobody cared. And that's why the land was destroyed. Look, judgment's coming to America, is it not? But maybe if God looked down and, 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 and instead of seeing a bunch of people who were just waiting for it to come and wanted it to come and want everyone just to go to hell and for the whole nation just to burn down, we're just waiting for that. Like Jonah, when, when Jonah just wanted Nineveh to be destroyed, there's a lot of people like that today who just want America to be destroyed. Do they, does America deserve the coming judgment? Yes. But should we be mourning with them? Should we just want it to happen? No. We should be doing what we can to try to get God to intercede and say, you know what, maybe I'll just wait a little bit. Let these people get some more people saved. Let them Amen. try to turn more people back to God. Maybe, 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 I'll just, maybe I'll just let them try to, to prolong it just a little longer. If you remember it, Josiah, Josiah's reign, he followed two of the, some of the worst kings that had ever reigned. And God told Josiah, he said, the judgment's coming either way. It is coming. But because of what you've done, I'm going to prolong it a little longer. It won't happen in your life. It's still coming. But because of your actions, I'm going to prolong it a little longer. Amen. And like I said, that's the book of Lamentations. It's a prophet who lived a miserable life. And, and yet, his heart was, he never, ever gave up on those people who, who were really the reason for that horrible life. And I wonder what happened in in America today. Obviously, the judgment's coming either way. Don't get me wrong. But I wonder what would happen in Fresno here if we cared enough 
to instead of just throwing up our hands and say it's coming anyway, the whole the whole country, the whole city can go to hell. California can just go to hell. I wonder if God would prolong it just a little longer if we actually had a little bit of compassion. You know, if God prolonged the judgment of America one day, that's more souls that would be saved. We should be we should be on our knees begging God. Just God, just wait, just a little longer, just a little longer, just a little longer. Just another Saturday to go out and win more people to Christ. Just another Saturday. You know, we hear a sermon like this and having compassion, and maybe for the next Saturday or two, we, we're like, yeah, we need to have compassion, need to have compassion uh, on people. But, you know, Jeremiah kept that mentality his whole life. And that's what we need to do. If, if we want God to, to allow us just to fulfill our mission of winning more people to Christ and leading more people to Christ just a little longer, we need to be like Jeremiah, where we're faithful with his will, where we're fervent with our mission, whatever happens, and where we are forbearing with these people, even though we know the judgment is coming. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer.